YLL PowerPoint presentation for DPPE, DJPE, and that's for Physical and Health Education 2-1 for 2022. The presenter, Mrs. A.C. Stain, cell phone number 081-277-5321 and ansystain at hotmail.com. Contact hours Mondays to Saturdays from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Now you can either phone me or SMS or email me and in the latter case I can send you a detailed answer. Please feel free to ask if anything is unclear or if you have problems regarding your subject. I'm willing to assist as far as I can. I'm going to discuss the most important facts of each unit separately. You will then be able to follow the content discussed if you page through your study guide while I'm discussing the content. Please note that this presentation is not a discussion of any exam paper, but of the most important content for the whole year. As an introduction to the study guide, I'm shortly going to explain some information regarding the guide itself. When you page to the front of the study guide, you will find a detailed table of contents. Here you will find the headings of the complete content and you will be able to have an overview of your subject for the year. Take time to read through it to familiarize yourself with the content you're going to study. On page 7, that's in the DPPE study guide, and 2, that's in the DJPE study guide, you will find very important information regarding the time you are required to spend with the subject in order to be a successful student. Because this is distant teaching, it's very important that you spend adequate time right throughout the year with your study material. To just start studying before the exams will not be wise and it will be hard to write the exams successfully. I recommend that you spend time every day with your studies. Even half an hour every day will be worthwhile. Consistency is the key to being a successful student. When you turn the page, you will find action verbs or then verbs thinking processes. These words form the key of the assignment and also the exam paper. For example, when you are requested to analyze facts, you will have to present facts in detail. And when you have to outline, you have to only give an overview and present the main features. Make sure to know what is expected of you when these verbs are present in your assignment and exam paper. When you turn to Unit 1, you firstly find the table of content of this unit and then the learning outcomes. Learning outcomes are an indication of what content you will find in the specific unit. Learning activities, that's LA in short, follow the learning outcomes. In these learning activities, you will find specific questions regarding the content of the specific unit. It will be wise to firstly try to answer these questions on your own and thereafter look at the answers which are at the end of each unit. When studying for the exams, use these questions to study because they form the core of the content and are very important. Do not forget to also study the assignment you completed because some of these questions will also be asked in the exams. You will notice that this presentation is presented for DPPE as well as DJPE students. Although the content of these two study guides are not 100% the same, both study guides are taken into account when uh, marking the question papers, so you will not be influenced negatively in any way, regardless the course you follow. I mention this because some students were concerned that the two study guides differ in some ways. Study from the guide you received and be assured that all students are treated equally whether you are a DPPE or DJPE student. Now we're going to page to Unit 1. Before we discuss the content of the study guide, you first should acquaint yourself what physiology and anatomy are. In other words, the study field of physiology and anatomy. 
In 1.1, you find these descriptions. Physiology is the science of the function of the human body. Physiology aims to understand the mechanisms of living, in other words, how living things work, whereas anatomy describes the structures of living things, what the body parts look like, their shape, and where the parts of the body are located, where in the body they can be found. So if you clearly understand the difference, we can start discussing the content of Unit 1. 1 1.2 is about the different body systems, like the skeletal system, which consists of the bones and joints. Important here is to know the different body systems and out of what each one consists. The next point of interest is 1.3, how exercise promotes health and fitness. It controls weight, it combats health conditions and diseases, it improves mood, boosts energy, promotes better sleep, puts back the spark into physical intimacy, and it can be fun. These are the benefits of exercise. Know these facts, but also know how to describe each fact. In 1.4, uh, quite a few definitions are set out. That's in 1.4. At this stage, you only need to know four, namely flexibility, which is the amount of movement possible at a particular joint, and muscular strength, which is the ability of the muscle to generate the maximum amount of force against a force external that's outside the body, and endurance, which is the ability to exert maximum force against an object outside the body for several repetitions. And the last one is power, which is the ability to perform maximum ex effort in the shortest time possible, where muscular strength is the ability to perform maximum amount of force. That's the difference. The importance of health and physical education is described in 1.5. There are quite a few benefits. For example, cardiovascular, that's heart function is more efficient when we exercise. The heart muscles become stronger, blood pressure reduces, etc. Study these facts. They are set out in 1.5. In 1.6, uh, it is described how, uh, what current health problems are in young people. Currently, some young people experience different kinds of health problems. Examples are malnutrition, that's not eating a healthy, balanced meal every day. So make sure to know what um, malnutrition in entails. Cardiovascular or heart diseases is another current health problem. Age, HIV, depression, which is a health, uh, mental health problem, are but some of the health problems experienced. So study 1.6 in detail to know the different problems experienced. You must be able to name them and also discuss at least three of them, especially malnutrition. The last part of interest in Unit 1 is 1.10 where development of teamwork of a sports team is discussed in detail. A coach should be able to help the team to be successful and teamwork is an essential part of this. What can the coach then do? Cooperation amongst the players must be developed. Socialising should take place. Confidence of the players should be developed. These are but a few tips. Study them all in 1.10. In Unit 2, 2.3 names six phases of motor development. Very important. Make sure to know them all. The names correctly and the years associated to each phase. But also know what each one entails 
as described in 2.3. In 2.4, the criteria whether games and activities are appropriate for pre-primary learners are set out. Not that all games are suited, uh, suitable for these learners, so you have to comply to the following criteria. The first one should be, it should provide safe play. It should meet the requirements of all the different abilities of the learners. Not all learners are able to do the same level of games. It also should support the developmental principle, meaning that a pre-primary learner is not as developed as a 15-year-old learner, so the activity must meet the age-appropriate level, etc. You should be able to name and discuss these criteria only. The following content of importance is that you should know what games are for large groups as mentioned in 2.7 like soccer, rugby, netball etc. Also games for small groups as set out in 2.6 like do this do that and hopscotch. Games for pairs can be tennis, table tennis, squash, darts, etc., as mentioned in 2.5. And in 2.8, <clears throat> then also tag and dodging games like chain tag, partner tag, etc., in 2.8. You should be able to name these different kinds of games, but also to identify a certain game, meaning if I name soccer, you should know that, is an, that it is an example of games for large groups, etc. Traditional games of the Namibian culture are very interesting, and while learners play them, they learn that there are other cultures also, which should be respected. One of these games is Dilla Ekende, that's full the bottle, played by colour and black communities. A soft round ball is used, the size of a tennis ball, and two teams play in a circle. Make sure to describe the game from the beginning to the end 100% correctly. Now the best way to learn the game is to play it yourself and then describe it as the game progresses. See 2.10 for that. When we turn to Unit 3, the first content of importance can be found in 3.1. Certain skills are developed while learners play on the playground. For example, balance, when they walk on a log. Flexibility, when they swing on a ball. Agility, that's changing direction fast when the game touch is, for instance, played. Rhythm when dancing. Study all these skills to be able to name them. In 3.2, we find the features of a good playground, meaning things you will find on a playground which help the, with the development of the child. Also, what types of playground characteristics are necessary to be a good, effective playground for learners. There should be shade and shelter from the sun and the rain. There should be a water play area, not just for drinking, but to play in water for the sensation and enjoyment. This does not mean a swimming pool, but a trough full of water to play with boats and other play equipment. It should also have a sand play area, meaning a sand pit on the playground, where they can build sand castles, feel dry and wet sand and be creative. A sand pit develops their small muscles when they play with the sand. They also feel the texture, so tactile stimulation takes place. And they also socialize, which is a skill. Again, it is a specific sand box, big enough for several learners to play in, ideally covered with the roof to prevent sunburn. And this does not mean it is the whole sandy area of the playground. A small garden area is one of the features where seeds can be planted so that learners can watch them grow and also learn to water plants. That's essential for a good playground. Study the value of a garden too. 
Grass is also essential. It will not, will not cover the whole playground. It is only a designated area on the playground. Here they can skip, hop and play soccer and other activities. But there should also be a hard surface area which is a paved or uh, which is paved or bricked where the ball, clay, uh, uh, ball games can be played. Murals are also important. A mural is a wall where learners can paint and write on. A good idea is to cover the wall with blackboard paint to write on. Playground markings are where learners can play hopscotch, there can be a mini road where they can ride their play cars and bikes and so forth. The last feature is tractor tires which they can roll and climb on and through. You should be able to name these features but also know the value of each so study 3.2 in detail for these uh, important aspects. So let us look at the big play equipment on a playground as described in 3.3. It should be able to, able to develop their big muscles, develop coordination and balance, etc. What are these suitable equipment then? Climbing structures like a jungle gym, which develops their balance, coordination and large muscles. If you are uncertain what a jungle gym looks like, make sure to acquaint yourself with this. A proposal is to Google jungle gym images to find out exactly what it entails. Slides is another big game equipment. Um, where they develop coordination and social skills. Swings develop arm and leg muscles, also helps with socializing. A horizontal bar, a wooden bar in the shape of a rectangle to balance and climb on. Tunnels, trampolines are also suitable to enhance certain skills like balance, core strength, coordination, etc. You should be able to name these big play equipment, but also the importance of each one of them. C3.3 for that. The following are important content of Unit 4. In 4.1, it is discussed how equipment should be placed so as to facilitate supervision by teachers and also to minimize accidents. Big equipment like swings for example, should be inspected daily to ensure that they are in good working order. Small equipment like bean bags should not be placed on the ground for learners to drop and fall over them. And they should always be packed away after use. There are quite a few more important facts. Study them well in 4.1. In 4.2, it is discussed how a teacher can effectively manage a PE class. PE is more informal and it can easily encourage learners to challenge the discipline of a teacher. How can a PE teacher then manage such a class? Preventing ill discipline? In 4.2, Certain tips in this regard are discussed, like to use positive reinforcement, to structure classes that foster, that's to ensure success. Don't let learners choose their teams because this can be an embarrassment to the less popular learners. Don't make PE classes about winning. These are but a few proposals to ensure good discipline. Study 4.2 in detail to know what and how to do to ensure that a PE class is presented effectively and successfully. <coughs> also study the headings regarding supervision, equipment and rules found in 4.2 so that you can discuss each heading. Safety on a playground is of utmost importance and C4.4 for that. Therefore, the following are very important. Enough supervisors for the number of learners. Written playground rules to be discussed and followed by the learners. Equipment to on the playground should be checked regularly and be well maintained. 
To find out all the safety features, study 4.4 extensively. I mentioned above that there should be playground rules. Can you think of a few you will, uh, that will be important? This means what children should adhere to. One would be that not more than one learner should use a swing at the same time. Slide with feet first and sitting up, not standing. Stand back from a seesaw when in use. Do not litter on the playground. Fellow learners can trip over a can fall example. Think about a few more rules children should adhere to in order to make it a safe place. And 4.2 can help you in this regard. The last paragraph important, of importance is in Unit 4, that's 4.5. What will you do in case an accident did happen on the playground in spite of all the precautions taken? Make sure to study 4.5 in this regard. In Unit 5, it is about the suitable indoor and outdoor play areas. 5.1 discusses the different categories of play. This means at different ages in a child's life, different kinds of play take place. A newborn baby does not play at all. He or she is too young. So this stage is called unoccupied play. When being a little older, the child plays on his or her own, and that's called solitary play. In this way, a certain kind of play takes place in every age group of this child. Study all the stages, categories found here, but study solitary play specifically in order to be able to discuss this stage in detail. Indoors is the space in the classroom because it's a small place for learners to do activities in. Running, kicking off a ball and for example playing cricket cannot be done here. In fact, the indoors need to meet some criteria like it should be predictable, it should have clear paths to activities, it should have well-defined boundaries the paint area and the car playing area should be clear to the children, not to overlap. There are quite a few more criteria. Know them all as found in 5.2. Indoor refers to in the classroom, while outdoors refer to the playground outside the classroom. Would you be able to identify which play equipment and areas are suitable for indoors? Study 5.4 to find out. A few will be board games, chess, a painting area, puzzle area, a fantasy play area, that's for indoors. Why do you think are they suitable for indoors and not for outdoors? To play chess and build puzzles outside would create problems because children need a safe, small, secure area to de do these activities. The puzzle pieces will also quickly get lost on the playground and the same goes for the chess pieces. On the other hand, swings and a slide are definite outside equipment. They are too large to keep indoors. Make sure to be able to identify the different indoor and outdoor equipment and also why they are suitable for indoors and outdoors specifically. You can see 5.4 and 5.5 and 3.2, they will all help you in this regard. As mentioned, the indoor area is a smaller place than the outdoors, that's the playground, because it is a space inside the classroom. A teacher has many equipment to store in the classroom and that is why this storeroom space should be well maintained. It should be easable, easily accessible. It should be clearly marked. It should uh, keep the space uncluttered. There are quite a few more reasons for the need of indoor storage facilities. Study them all in 5.6. The last unit to study is Unit 6. Sport 
builds the character of a child. Why? Because it's helps, it helps them to establish endurance, to keep on trying until they can, for example, score a goal in soccer. It teaches them to set a goal for themselves to achieve it, like to run 100 meters in, say, 15 seconds. Moral habits are established. That's to be honest, to, uh, to not take bribes, etc. Their concentration, confidence, control and commitment are established when taking part in sports. Study these fa facts extensively in 6.1 in order to be able to discuss them. Also critically, in other words, not to just mentioning the facts, but why the facts are true and regarded important. Why do you think is it important for an athlete to warm up before a race? It prevents injuries. It improves performance because blood flow increases to the muscles, etc. This is discussed in 6.2, which should be studied. Another topic is good sportsmanship. It's a characteristic which should be reinforced by a coach. What would you say? If a coach, question, a coach questions the decisions of a referee and goes on the field to query them, will this be good or bad sportsmanship? 6.8 says that results of a game should be accepted with grace, meaning to accept it if you lose a game and not to blame others or the referee. Also, to congratulate competitors after, after a game, even if lost. See and study 6.8 in this regard. There are many other tips and when studying these tips, you will get to know when is sportsmanship good and when is it bad. It is obvious that bad sportsmanship is the exact opposite of good sportsmanship. So if you know the examples of good sportsmanship, you will be able to name and identify bad sportsmanship. For example, to congratulate competitors after a game, even if lost, is a good thing. But the opposite, namely not to congratulate the competitors, will be an example of bad sportsmanship, etc. 6.9 touches a very important topic, namely the qualities of a good coach. Many people can coach, but to be a good coach requires certain qualities. What would you say? What would some qualities be? He or she should know the sport, he or she coaches, and be willing to keep up to date with the rules and equipment while coaching the specific sport. Also, he or she should know the players, their names, each player's strong but also weak points. A coach should be a reliable person, should be well disciplined and be able to discipline the players. A coach should be a positive person and also be able to influence persons, uh, uh, players positive, even if they lost a game. There are many other qualities a good coach should display, so study this extensively in 6.9. Also page to the LA in this regard at the end of the unit. It does happen that a school principal can expect from the PE teacher to plan, organize and help with the execution of school athletics or sports events. Can you think uh, about important issues to organize in order to make it a successful event? Let us start from the beginning. You need the athletes' names and ages in order to divide them into their appropriate groups and also the items you're going to present. You need helpers, that's the starter, catchers at the end of the race and recorders of the winners, etc. There should be an announcer, clean toilet facilities, food and cool drinks, Parents should be informed exactly when and where the event will take place, so you need to determine the venue, the starting time, with the consent of the principal. I'm sure you will realize that there are many other aspects to give attention to. Therefore, study 6.10 to know these aspects well.
You can also study LA, that's Learning Activity 7 for DPP students and LA5 for DJPE students at the end of Unit 6 in this regard. You will notice that the LAs, that's learning activities, play a big role in studying, so make use of them while studying. While studying each unit, make sure to first read the LA questions found at the beginning of each unit in order to find out whether they are applicable to the content of the presentation. If so, this will help you to better understand the work. And many times, they are a summary of the content discussed in the unit. In that way, it will help you with your studies. This then concludes the discussion of the most important content of your study guide. Please feel free to contact me should you have any questions or uncertainties. Please note that you only need to study your study guide for these exams as well as your assignment. And remember that when answering a question, facts from different parts of the study guide can be applicable. It's not necessarily limited to one part of the study guide. It is important to note that although physical and health education may seem as a non-exam subject for learners and a period where learners are encouraged to explore in a less formal environment, you as teacher should exactly know how to keep them busy and how and why certain activities should be presented. Therefore, the teacher should know certain facts about the subject PHE as well as the correct procedures regarding the presentation of PHE. If, uh, it is therefore of utmost important that you as teacher should know facts regarding the subject. I stress this because some of the students are of the opinion that this subject does not need to be studied for and then they do poorly in the exams. Take time to know your study guide in order to present adequate facts during the exams. Please note that short answer questions will be also asked. The first one will be, uh, for example, to fill in words left out. You can uh, get a sentence uh, like, uh, what is used during relay races? And you will have to fill in then, baton. Second one is definitions of certain t terminology, for example, strength, which is the ability of the body to exert a maximum force against a force external to the body. The third one will be short descriptions of functions of a body part, for example, or of certain types of exercises. Another kind will be where two columns can be given to you, a column A and a column B. In column A, you can find certain facts like international health problem, speed, chocolates and sweets. And in column B, the appropriate answers will be like in not a healthy option to eat, HIV, the ability to move from one place to another in the shortest time possible. And you have to connect the correct answers. And the correct answers in this case will be 1B, 2C, and 3A. You only fill in the correct letters. Do not write out the words. Please feel free to contact me regarding any uncertainties and questions you have about your subject. Good luck with the exams. You will be rewarded for hard work and dedication.